I don't know that I need to say anything after that. Um, I'll tell you when she sent when Hannah sent me her kind of her pre-writing on this, uh, I, I I teared up to great length to see how God has uh, has worked through these trials uh, and the suffering that she has faced, and very much probably a relatable story to you. Your your details may be different. Uh, but what caught me this time, even as she was sharing it again, was how quick we are to feel like we are failing. To feel like we are on our own when we are facing trials. And yet how much more we need one another and we need Christ in that time. So thank you again, Janet. What a powerful testimony. And this this is why I believe that testimonies are such a powerful thing. It's an authentic story of how God is working in our lives. Our passage this morning comes from the book of Job, chapter 36, verses 15 through 23. So if you would like to follow along in your Bible, feel free. Otherwise, it will be up here on the screen. He delivers the afflicted in their affliction and opens their ear in a time of oppression. Then indeed, he enticed you from the mouth of distress, instead of it a broad place with no constraint. And that which was set on your table was full of fatness, but you were full of judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold of you. Beware that wrath does not entice you to scoffing. And do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. Will your riches keep you from distress or all the forces of your strength? Do not long for the night when people vanish in their place. Be careful not to turn to evil, for you have preferred this to affliction. Behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has appointed him his way? And who has said, you have done wrong? One significant misconception that people seem to have quite frequently about the Christian faith is this belief that somehow God is going to make our life easier, not harder. I've wanted to spend the entirety of my life glorifying God. To live a life that reflects God's infinite power. And so that he gets the praise, not me. The Bible is full of stories where God reveals his power through his people. When I read these stories, I can't help but have this kind of renewed sense of vigor that says, Lord, please use me just as you use David just as you use the disciples. Maybe you can relate to that. But there's something else that we either miss or that we hope we don't have to endure. When God uses these people, what tool does he use? Comfort or trials? The answer, we all know, is trials. It's God's most used tool. He entrusted Job and Daniel, Moses and David, Isaiah and Paul, and many others with major trials. The reason we remember these people is because of the great trials that they faced. And had God not helped them overcome them, we may not even know their names. This has massive implications in our lives. Because we still serve the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He still uses trials. I don't know that I need to say anything after that. Um, I'll tell you, when, she sent, when Hannah sent me her kind of her pre-writing on this, uh, I, I, I teared up to great length to see how God has, uh, has worked through these trials uh, and the suffering that she has faced, and very much, 
probably a relatable story to you. Your, your details may be different, uh, but what caught me this time, even as she was sharing it again, was how quick we are to feel like we are failing. To feel like we are on our own when we are facing trials, and yet how much more we need one another and we need Christ in that time. So thank you again, Janet. What a powerful testimony. And this, this is why I believe that testimonies are such a powerful thing. It's an authentic story of how God is working in our lives. Our passage this morning comes from the book of Job, chapter 36, verses 15 through 23. So if you would like to follow along in your Bible, feel free. Otherwise, it will be up here on the screen. He delivers the afflicted in their affliction and opens their ear in a time of oppression. Then indeed, he enticed you from the mouth of distress. Instead of it, a broad place with no constraint. And that which was set on your table was full of fatness. But you were full of judgment on the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold of you. Beware that wrath does not entice you to scoffing. And do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. Will your riches keep you from distress or all the forces of your strength? Do not long for the night when people vanish in their place. Be careful not to turn to evil, for you have preferred this to affliction. Behold, God is exalted in his power. Who is a teacher like him? Who has appointed him his way? And who has said, you have done wrong? One significant misconception that people seem to have quite frequently about the Christian faith is this belief that somehow God is going to make our life easier, not harder. I have wanted to spend the entirety of my life glorifying God. To live a life that reflects God's infinite power, and so that he gets the praise, not me. The Bible is full of stories where God reveals his power through his people. When I read these stories, I can't help but have this kind of renewed sense of vigor that says, Lord, please use me just as you use David, just as you use the disciples. Maybe you can relate to that. But there's something else that we either miss or that we hope we don't have to endure. When God uses these people, what tool does he use? Comfort or trials? The answer, we all know, is trials. It's God's most used tool. He entrusted Job and Daniel, Moses and David, Isaiah and Paul, and many others with major trials. The reason we remember these people is because of the great trials that they faced. And had God not helped them overcome them, we may not even know their names. This has massive implications in our lives. Because we still serve the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He still uses trials, are exempt. He uses the storms of life. So this should be a reality check. If we want to be used by God for his glory, we must be prepared to endure trials. God entrusts us with these trials, and oftentimes, lots of them. Paul was quoted as saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. 
being used by God isn't easy. If it was, everyone would be doing it. But it's worth it. If we want to be used by God for His glory, we have to be prepared to face the trials that God will lay before us. So maybe a question that's on your mind is, why does God use trials? Why can't He just make the road, the road smooth? It's because of what trials do in our lives. Charles Spurgeon once said, Trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and let us see what we are made of. God never says, oops. He's not up in heaven, wringing his hands, wondering what's going to happen, or what the outcome of some event will be. Even if we can't see the end, God knows the end from the beginning. We know that God is working things out for his glory, and so even in the midst of these trials where it is very difficult to see beyond the here and now, we know that God is at work. Our hearts can find this peace that Janet referenced, because we remember that God's promises are to work for his glory and our good. So one of the things that I like to do is to offer up kind of a theme or a theme statement, a sentence for the week, so that when you go out into your daily lives and you interact with people, you won't remember everything I said. But what you can do is take this sentence and use this as a summary for what it was that we talked about. And so our sermon in a sentence this week is this. God's ultimate purpose for us in trials that cause suffering is to reveal our need for Jesus and to conform us into his image. Oh, what wonders we can learn through our suffering if we keep our eyes fixed on God. First, pain is not without purpose. Suffering is the one thing that can allow you to transmit comfort to those around you. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves Receive from God. I've said it this way. When you endure suffering in a specific area, you have an access point to speak into the lives of those, particularly in areas that you have already suffered. So for those of you walking through cancer, or some other illness, or MS, whatever it may be, there are other people that are walking through the same journeys, and you have an opportunity to speak a reason for your hope into their lives. Without our own suffering and our experience of the comfort of the gospel of grace, we have nothing to offer. We cannot offer anything of value from our own strength. The gospel of grace comes to us in prayer and spiritual gifts of other disciples. This is how we bring comfort to those who are suffering, so that we can join them in their time of need. Trials are what allow God to change our perspective. Trials may even bring you to your knees, begging you God to act wondering where he might be. But when you've embedded God's word in your heart, you understand that he is always at work. But even with that knowledge, there are times in our trials that we must cling to his word, 
like a sailor who is drowning and how they would hang on to a life raft. Storms will come, but his truth will keep you afloat. In Psalm chapter 46, we read, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for our good. Secondly, trials put God's power on display. It never ceases to amaze me how quick we are to put faith in our own strength. Our lives often reveal an underlying belief that we have the ability to overcome trials on our own. Just pick up your, or uh, I was going to use the expression that my wife uses, and now I'm going to do just pick yourself up by the bootstraps, and that will get you through it. Yet trials are potent reminders that we are nothing without God. The last two weeks, you've heard about Gideon and about the fact that his army was one-fifth of the size of the army that he was to face. And God said, that's too many. And so he reduces his army even more. Why? He did not want Israel to boast by being able to say that it was by their hand that they had saved themselves. And he wants them to know that God was the saving force. He uses trials to show that he alone deserves the credit. He makes it clear to us that we are not in control of our lives. When we deal with trial well, everyone can see that we don't have the ability or strength to overcome it. We're not trying to put on a brave face. All we can do is pray and lift up our circumstances to God. It becomes self-evident that God is in control and that He alone has the power to grow us through trials. Third, Trials prepare us for service, even little ones. So here's the bad news. When God works in a big way, God involves his servant by facing a big trial. So if you want, if you want the responsibility to honor God in big ways and to be responsible for a big uh, big outcome, you've got to be prepared for big trial. And yet what we see is that God doesn't first uh, entrust people with big tasks or big trials. He begins with small trials in many cases. He's testing us. So in the midst of what you face on a daily basis, the frustrations you face, these things that you might not even consider a trial, you just think it's a norm of your day, these are trials that God is uprooting in you. He's asking you, what is it in your heart? He's revealing to you that you trust yourself too much. If we expect God to use us in big ways, we've got to prove ourselves to be faithful in the little things. If we can't pass the little things, the little tests that he places in front of us, why should we expect him to entrust us with even more? As I look back over the 12 years that Emily and I have been married, the seven moves that we've made into four different states, the number of students bless and touch and, and them touch us, as well as my previous experience in ministry, God has continually used trials. If I wasn't in one, I was getting ready to go into one. Much like our physical body grows through trial, so too does our spiritual soul. They go through the trials that we face in life. Another way to look at it is this. If we don't face trials, our body and our soul in particular grows weak. 
Author Seth Godin said it like this. Soldiers realize that it is war that makes generals. And if we want to be soldiers for Christ, we have to be willing to go through the battles that are entrusted to us. Paul says it like this in Romans chapter 5. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Fourth, trials sanctify us. Trials reveal weakness. Perhaps this is the reason why we are hesitant to share our trials. They reveal our inner sin. Only once sin is made known to us can we entrust God to work in our hearts. The greatest battle that we face is the battle within ourselves. It's because of this that I can look back on my life, particularly my adult life, and say, God's greatest tool of instrument in my life for growth has been trials. It has not been the sunny days. It's been the rainstorms. The harder they've come, the more growth that I've seen. During this period of suffering, in order to grow mature, we've got to keep our focus on God's ultimate goal for our lives, which may cause us to say, what is that goal? The Bible tells us that God is at work in every aspect of our lives, including our suffering, to transform us from the inside out, to become like the Savior. Our goal, our main goal is not to have our lives be made easier or to live some human-based, fulfilling life. It is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Suffering demonstrates our quality of faith. It reminds us how much we need Jesus and how we need to grow in order to trust him. We find him as a good shepherd who walks at our side and wraps us up in his love. The genuineness of our faith is exposed. It's easy for us to think that we are mature in faith, to think we are more mature in our faith than we really are. Trials teach us to trust Jesus in a deeper way. It's, if our faith has been proven true, then it will remain strong until the day of the judgment. And we will be able to rejoice, not in our own power, but in the power of the gospel of grace that God gave us to be able to withstand the trials. We will finally, fully have a faith that is greater and more precious than gold. We should count it, all, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet various kinds of trials. For you know that testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Somewhere along the way, I fear that we've lost this sense of what it takes to get to a place of steadfastness. We don't just arrive by happenstance. It's through the journey. Fifth, trials make us depend upon God. Trials are something that can lead us to a place where we need to get on our knees and pray. God uses these trials to turn our dependence fully upon him, and to find peace in him alone. The reason that I said earlier that the greatest battle is within us is that our sinful heart does not want to relinquish control. Trials are God's tool to help break us of that dependence 
on ourselves, so that we trust in Him alone. Trials continually lead us to a place where we need to rely on God. They make it clear that there is only one who is sovereign. In 1 Corinthians, something I've already quoted in previous weeks, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. As it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Next, trials show that God is dependable. Whether you realize it or not, as you go through trials, others are watching. They're watching to see if you respond in faith. You see, having peace in the midst of comfort is normal. But having a peace that endures trials is not. There is no better platform for us to share about the hope that we have in Christ than through the trials that we have. When we can endure them and give glory and honor to God, who can, who can stand against that? Who can, who can understand that because of the power of your faith in Christ? It is not about yourself. It is about Christ. If you complain or have a bad attitude, that often, uh, that often changes your ability or relinquishes your opportunity to share about the goodness of God. God, I'm sorry, God entrusts us with trials so that we can be a light. Let's not waste these opportunities. Peter wrote this, But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, the hope that is in you. Seven, trials might be spiritual warfare. As you can tell, God's placed a lot more points on my plate this week than normal. But this is a big one, too, because in the West, we are very quick to not think about spiritual warfare. Does that mean that every trial we face is? No, but they could be part of it. When our life and the ministry that we are after is pursuing God's glory, we should not be surprised when Satan doesn't want to give that space up quickly or easily. We are entering Satan's strongholds. He will not go down without a fight. But the great news is we don't need to live in fear because Satan is like a dog on God's leash. He can only do what God allows. He may allow us to experience pain in our lives, and I'll say, God bless him that he does. I'm so thankful for the three testimonies that we've heard in the last three weeks about what God has placed in each of these people's lives that have caused growth. But always remember that whatever you face, God is using it for your good. When trials come, we must keep our eyes fixed on God. But we must also be aware of Satan's tactics so that we would not be outwitted by Satan or be ignorant. Satan wants to discourage us so that we give up. He will attack your health, your family's health, your family. He will send a myriad of trials into your life to take you out of the fight. Don't let it. Keep your eyes on God. If you are getting bombarded with trials, take heart. It might be because Satan is very displeased about your life and ministry. 
In Psalm 27, David writes, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And John wrote, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And lastly, trials may be for discipline. And even though I've listed this last, this is where we ought to always start. Start with the heart. God often uses trials or sickness to get our attention to some sin in our lives. Again, this is not always true, but this is sometimes why trials are placed before us. He may be saying, slow down and find your rest in me. He may be calling us back to revisit something in our life that when we are so busy, we miss. Some sin in our hearts. He wants to restore us with him through fellowship. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. It's kind of a not much appreciated word in our culture, discipline. But remember that when you are going through these stages where, where you sense that God is disciplining you for something, know that it's because he loved you. I remember as an athlete hearing the statement that, when, that if a coach disciplines you, he sees potential. And you shouldn't worry about that. What you should worry about is when he quits talking to you. And in Psalm chapter 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way of the everlasting. Oh, to have a heart like that. To long for God to inspect your every motive. To trust and to repent when, our, when, when, we are, when we are discovered as we are. When sin is called out in our lives. I just ask the Lord you know, in my life that he, he tear those things away. So how can we endure our trials with joy? We've heard the last two weeks two great testimonies of that. People that are dealing with significant trials and yet are doing so with joy. How can we find peace? Janet referenced it today. It's a changed perspective. Peter walked on the water when his eyes were fixed on the king. But when his eyes adjusted to the storm, he sank. The storms and the trials in life will rage, but our perspective changes everything. Don't Run from the trials in your life. Don't try to fortify your life in a way so that you can try to keep yourself safe. God's at work in us. He entrusts us with trials. He wants to use us for his glory. Take time out of each day and be thankful for what he has given you. Even the trials that God has placed in you. When I find myself going through a significant journey, I try desperately hard each morning to pray, God, thank you for entrusting me with this trial. Help me to live well. One side heart surgery a couple of years ago, I think many of you have at least heard that, and it was in that trial where I remember God putting on my heart to continually to focus on where God would grow us. I had, no, I had no power over the surgery. But what I did have control over was that I was seeking to see where God was moving and how he was going to grow us. And one reward from that is that we're here. Had that not happened, we probably would have been in a different ministry. 
So glory to God that he's brought us here. If you find yourself in these trials, take courage. He is working. So let me close with this encouragement. It's from John chapter 16. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so we remember that God's ultimate purpose for us in the trials that we endure that cause suffering is our need to be conformed to his image and our need for Jesus. Let's pray.